Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and welcome to part 5, the exciting conclusion of our review slash game diary slash war stories for the Traveler Mini Campaign, The Mystery of BTSHT365. Today's episode covers Act 4, The City of Carillon. The final act is the shortest, only coming to five pages, but it took us an eight-hour session in order to play it all. It brings us to the surface of this lost planet and face-to-face -face with our antagonist, and also gives us an incredible amount of combat. I would love to say that it answers all of our questions that have been brought up throughout the adventure, but it doesn't. What are you talking about? It answered all of our questions. Yeah, that's because I've been adding details all along the way, and I wrote in a bunch of answers for you guys to find at the end, which I will be providing as tips and suggestions for any game masters out there who would like to run this adventure for their own groups. But now let's bring in our heroes. Unfortunately, Jax, our trusty medic and overall badass marine, had to miss this session. So while all the other travelers Travelers were off kicking ass, he was in the med bay, recovering from his injuries from part 4, or in the bathroom, recovering from a bean burrito, you decide for yourself. But the rest of our heroes are Ignis, captain who has never failed a piloting check, Grista, our Varger co-pilot and usually the voice of reason, Moto, sensor operator who brought a war pick to a machine gun fight, and Vince, our rock star ship steward who is recording all of these adventures with drones in order to make this a reality show to promote his image. Joining them are Jerry, the ship's mascot who doesn't say all that much, Coraline, their noble woman patron, and 37, a mysterious girl who the heroes don't trust, so they froze her in the berth next to Jerry. Their ship is the Cygnus Crucible, a modified 200-ton free trader that they call home. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players out there, if you ever want to experience this adventure, please stop here. But send your game masters this way for tips and suggestions on how to run this adventure for you. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. We last left our heroes, they were on the battered highport station above the planet. From there, they learned that a 400-ton survey scout had entered the system some weeks before and is currently in orbit above this capital city of Carillon. It has sent down a modular cutter to the surface. Now, I find this orbiting ship to be a good obstacle or objective for the characters, but other than a brief mention that it exists in Act 3, the module never ever mentions this ship again. So what I did is that I went ahead and made a few changes to it. I gave it three turrets and increased the number of staterooms to accommodate all of the Jetico employees that it was carrying with it. Also, in order for the travelers to get to the planet without being detected by this Jetico ship, you know, thus alerting them to their presence before they got there, the travelers would have to make several good piloting and sensor checks in order to get to the city safely, you know, sort of skimming along the surface real low. Game masters should always remember that that ship is in orbit because the players might respond to it. Uh, maybe they're going to try to attack it, or maybe they're going to try to board it before they go down to the planet. Or if they go down to the planet first, if that ship starts getting transmissions that they're being being attacked and being overwhelmed, maybe that ship is going to try to get out of orbit, try to get out of here, and tell somebody what's going on. The heroes decided that they were going to avoid the scout ship altogether and just merely go down to the planet side. They were all ready to go, but then Vince said, You know guys, I could set up the station's defense systems to fire all those nuclear torpedoes at any ship that ain't ours. That way, if we get our asses killed on that planet, we still get to get our revenge. The team decided that instead of just setting up the station or it was going to fire on any ship that wasn't the Crucible, that that probably wouldn't be a good idea. You know, what if they got down to the planet and the Crucible was taken out? Now the travelers are trapped on the planet because any ship that they try to steal would automatically get shot down itself. So they decided to have it be a switch that was aboard the Crucible and they could turn it on because the Crucible had a really good communications array. This required some pretty hard rolls for them to do it, but the players all pulled it off. The contingency set, they then headed down the gravity well to BTSHT365. The planet itself is just about dead, a barren desert with corrupted air, which requires respirators in order to breathe it. Now, that wasn't going to be a problem for them because I kind of sort of screwed up and gave all of them super powerful battle dress armor in Act 3. See my video on the Loot Fairy Game Master Sin if you want more information on that. Also, because I did give this power armor to the player characters, making them really powerful, I did have to up the bad guys in this scenario just a bit. You know, that way they could pose a pretty reasonable challenge. I didn't have to do it by much 
just a little bit, but I'll go into that once we actually get to the bad guys. Eventually, the Travelers made it to the capital city, which is one of the few cities that's actually still intact on the planet. Now, the module doesn't provide any map for this city, so I made my own. The city is on cliffs overlooking a now dried sea to the north, and there's cliffs to the west where a now dried river once flowed, and it used to have this really nice and pretty waterfall. The palace is here, overlooking the sea and the falls. Sensor checks can discover the modular cutter that's parked at the palace. I also had them do some sensor checks to find some good landing sites that'd be hard for Jetico to detect. Moto scored pretty poorly on this, so they ended up having to land on the far side of the city and approach the palace on foot. You know, guys, this whole dead city on a lost planet feels really familiar. This scene is clearly an ode to the movie Serenity, where the heroes are exploring a dead city on a forgotten planet, up into including the part where they find bodies that are preserved in buildings that are hermetically sealed. So it's clearly an ode to Serenity, but I like that movie, so I dig it. Now, one thing that I did add to this module is because the Jetico teams are all extremely armed and armored, even though this planet is supposed to be completely dead and completely devoid of life, and I didn't think that made much sense. So I went ahead and added a little bit of alien hostile life here that could explain why Jetico was so armed and armored. It wasn't much, just some sort of creepy bugworm monsters, which the heroes did detect while they were crossing the city and they managed to avoid them. But I figured that adding them at least answered the question as to why Jetico is so armed once the travelers discover them. Once they arrived at the palace, they discovered a large habitat module next to the modular cutter, which served as the bunkhouse and field hospital for the landing party, which of course the travelers broke into and in searched, you know, getting an idea of how many hostels they were going to find planned inside. Ignis managed to hack into the modular cutter, and once inside, they disabled not just the ship, but the comms relay that communicated with the survey scout still in orbit. That done, the travelers followed some tracks down into the mountain, where they could find the royal hangars. Again, the module doesn't give us any maps for the various locations that are found in here, so I made my own. The first is a small hangar with a control tower, repair bay, armory, as well as a maglev train that leads deeper into the mountain. The module places a Jetico fire team here, but doesn't say at all what they're doing, or why there's even a fire team at all on this dead planet. So in addition to the soldiers, I went ahead and added some regular workers to the mix. Uh, the fire team is here guarding the workers from the alien life that I put down here, as the workers are looting the armory and the repair bay, and then loading it all onto the tram's cars in order to get that off the planet. The workers have some lifter units, which the module does place in this module later on, but I stuck one here as well to explain what they're doing, but game masters are going to need a copy of the vehicle handbook for stats on these things. Because the heroes had completely evaded any sort of detection up to this point, the Jetico team had no clue that they were there, and then Vince sent a drone inside to do a little bit of recon, and the travelers then snuck down the stairs, planning on ambushing the bad guys. It was a great plan, but then Ignis botched his stealth roll and fell down the steps as Harmer clanging and alerting the Jetico goons that they had arrived. The firefight here was great. Now, because I did have to up the bad guys because those heroes were all in this power armor, the only changes that I made that instead of five Jetico people, there was now going to be seven, and the machine gun had armor-piercing heap ammo. The squad leader was also given a laser rifle. The fighting went wonderfully, but I'm not going to give you the play-by-play -play of who rolled what and when they did it, because that's all boring to listen to. The important part here is that the Jetico team is going to radio down to the other teams below that they are under attack. So the other teams that the travelers find along this are going to be on the alert because they know that hostiles have arrived. Once the heroes had captured or killed all the bad guys, I was kind of impressed at how many bad guys they captured. You know, usually have a tendency to go a bit murder hobo on me. But once that was done, they loaded up onto the tram and continued on. Now on the tram, some sort of ninja agent guy is going to drop down from the ceiling, where he evidently just hangs out all the time, cut his way through the train roof, and then with a static blade start hacking up the heroes. I figured this would be a great melee fight to have. But Moto won the initiative, and then the instant the ninja dropped aboard the train, he shot and killed him with a fantastic maser shot from the opposite side of the tram. Whoa! What the hell was that? The train stops at an infirmary lab, and I decided that it stopped because there was some rubble blocking the track, and it was actually supposed to be a lot more further down, but the travelers weren't going to be able to get to it. Along the walkway, I added a stairwell and a freight elevator that left led down to the final level. For the infirmary, I also added three doctors and a pair of Jetico soldiers that were here protecting them. The armored glass doors included decontamination and positive air pressure, so therefore the air inside was safe to breathe. 
Inside, the heroes discovered several interesting things. First was a set of cryobirths, each housing a clone identical to 37. The module never gives stats or any information other than if they check the records, it reveals that 37 was an viable candidate for training, but it doesn't give us anything more than that. Essentially, these clones are just window dressing to the module. Their purpose is never ever explained to anybody, and outside of 37 serving as sort of a plot point of being a mute damsel in distress in Act 3, you could delete these clones entirely from the scenario and no one would even notice. But because I gave 37 the ability to speak, and I also added these scientist doctors here who were very quick to spill the beans once the travelers had captured them, uh, they learned that these clones were the product of a rogue division of Jedico, and that the DNA that was used to create them was made from a multitude of different sources, you know, trying to find the best of a lot of different people. Silvaria Marios was the first successful product of this experiment, and she was now leading this rogue team that is supposed to have been defunded. It was just a good way to show the players a bit of the overall plot, give them a scope of what's really going on. In the area behind the reception desk is a room with one of the black orbs from Act 1 and what was alluded to in Act 2. It's on a pedestal and hooked up to some sort of machine. Holy crap, do we finally get to learn what these mysterious orbs do? Not really. I mean, if a scion touches the pads on either side and expends three psi points, they get some jump coordinates for some known worlds, a bloody nose, but that's about it. Oh, well we don't even have a scion that could tell us how useless these things are for us. Exactly. Just like with these clones, the orbs are really just kind of a meaningless MacGuffin that does never explained and doesn't really add much to the game because it's not explained. So, once again, I changed it for our game. First, the travelers look through the window into this room, and they can see that there are three pedestals instead of one. And the orb was just sitting on one of them, and it was just spinning all these random directions. There's also a woman that was standing next to the orb, and she's kind of glitching or going transparent every few seconds, which is enough to tell the travelers that she's some sort of AI hologram. She's also essentially Janet from The Good Place. Like, I even named her Janet because, hey, why the hell not? Janet explains that these spheres are the cores to a planetary AI, but since she's missing two of them, the great majority of her functions are completely offline at the moment, and currently she's really only able to handle the power at the station that's done from a geothermal plant that's beneath the city. She says that she serves the Petrovskys, and Coraline explains that she's the last of the Petrovskys, and she puts her finger in a little DNA scanner in order to prove it. But then Janet says that the Blood Heirs already claim that title, and that is Silvaria Mario. And that's when the travelers learned that the DNA donors for this that were all clones, one of those at some point was of the Petrovsky family line. So Janet won't obey Coraline until either Silveria renounces her title as being the ruler of their planet or dies. Now Coraline, who's extremely pissed off that her birthright just got stolen from her, is more than willing to accommodate the second one. Using Janet's limited functions, they learn that Silveria and a team of Jedico employees are down on the lowest level loading some sort of ship. And while Janet wasn't going to turn off the power at the Traveler's request, the Travelers knew that they could just disable the power if they removed the orb from this pillar, because that's what Captain Karbakin's report said in Act 2. However, that was also going to give a little bit of an electric shock, but I was going to let them figure that part out for themselves. So their plan was that they were going to cut the power, that way Jedico couldn't open up the hangar doors and all the lights were going to go off, and that way they could ambush him in the dark. This was all part of a really well-timed plan that they put together, where Ignis and Coraline would stay up top and they'd pull the orb out and cut the power once the rest of the team was in position to do an ambush on the rest of this Jedico team. So let's go ahead and talk about how that went. The lowest level is the Royal Hangar. The module places a thousand ton destroyer escort down here, a Rasputin classic calls it. The thing has every single bell and whistle imaginable. It's streamlined, has 14 points of armor, thrust six, jump four, holographic controls, an intellect, four triple turrets, three barbettes, and much, much more. Using Highguard, I calculated the cost of this ship being over 625 million credits. The ship is fully operational, and Jedico looks like they're loading it up, like they're going to make some sort of escape. There's also four soldiers down here and cargo lifters, and there's ten other soldiers as well as Silvaria Marios. For my game, I made a couple changes to this. First, I removed the super ship entirely from the module. It's clearly intended to be a reward for the travelers once they complete this adventure, and it's just so much ship that I didn't want to give them that and have that throw off the balance of any future games going forward. So I changed the ship to being Silvaria's Serpent Class Scout ship that I had given her in a previous act. I also made it four workers, 15 soldiers, three of them had machine guns with heap ammo, 
Three squad leaders had laser rifles, and then one soldier was a sharpshooter with a laser sniper rifle. Now, because they had gotten radio transmissions from the other groups that the travelers had attacked, these soldiers were ready to repel borders. They had set up near the uh, entrances, which was the elevator and the stairwell, and they were ready to shoot on the first thing they saw. However, they weren't expecting the power to go out just moments before the shooting started. What followed was a great battle. The travelers struck hard and fast, and they pulled back up to the second level to a defensible position, took out any pursuers there, and then they headed back down to the hangar for the final sweep and clear. Tell them your favorite part. I don't know, it's, it's not really specific for this adventure itself. So, this is a war story. Tell them a war story. Okay, so I have played a lot of different modern and sci-fi RPGs over the years, and one thing that I have never seen in that entire time is a hand grenade being used effectively. And what I mean by that is a player character takes a hand grenade, pulls the pin, throws the grenade, and then the grenade does something dramatic, hopefully to the player's advantage. Now I have seen them used as booby traps in different ways, but just being used as a normal hand grenade? Never seen it. Now I have watched player characters throw holy water and flaming oil and sticks of dynamite and feral hobbits. Okay, that, that one's a lie. But I've watched them throw all sorts of different weapons and have that be perfectly effective. But any time a hand grenade seems to be used, that that's when we have all sorts of fumbles and all sorts of problems. I blame a lot of this on all the Cyberpunk 2020 that we used to play, and that's a game where fumbles can be very easy, only a 1 in 10 chance. And for whatever reason, not only did hand grenades fumble every single time somebody threw one, but once we rolled on what kind of fumble, it was always the worst kind. I have seen a player care character flashbang himself twice in the same session. I've had a PC wipe out half of their own party as the opening move to a combat. I once had a total party kill because a player character thought it was a good idea to pull out a hand grenade in close quarters and whoops, they dropped it. Even when we tried hand grenades in other games, you know, games where it's almost impossible to drop the hand grenade or do a miss throw, my players have defied the odds and still managed to fumble every single time they try to throw a grenade. The long story short is that my players are absolutely terrified of using hand grenades. I keep trying to give them hand grenades. I've literally given them boxes of hand grenades in different adventures like that and telling them that all those incidents that they remember, those were all random flukes and those are from other game systems. The chances of that happening again are just about zero. Use the hand grenades, guys. I promise they'll be fun. But they just won't touch them. But this session, not only did they use hand grenades in this session, they used the hell out of them. And there were so many grenade throws in this adventure with bad guys getting blasted off of different catwalks, giving Wilhelm screams as they fell to their death. In fact, the only hand grenade mishap that we had in this entire adventure was done by this random half-dead NPC who was in a stairwell. He was just about gone, so he pulled a hand grenade and threw it, and I rolled a snake eyes on the roll. So I said that, well, the hand grenade kind of bounces off the lip above the door, came clattering back down between his feet, and blew him to hell. It was hilarious. So while this really doesn't have anything to do with this particular scenario, Outside the fact that the scenario gave two hand grenades to all of these different Jetico goons, I am really happy to report that after all these years, my players and I finally got to experience how great hand grenades are because everybody's been telling us about it, but I've never seen it for myself. Okay, back to the module. Now, according to the module, Severia Marios doesn't appear until the player characters enter this big ship, in which case a door opens and she steps out and makes the attack, never saying a word. Now, the module never introduces her before this scene, and the player characters are probably not even going to know that she's the leader, outside from the fact that she is obviously going to be the most badass of all the opponents that they've met. This is why since Act 2 that I've been recommending that, play, that Game Masters put in some sort of foreshadowing, let the player characters have heard her name before, you know, seen a photo, seen a different messages or anything like that, such as when that hit squad tried to get them in Act 2 in that hotel, or have Coraline, when they meet her, say that she's heard the name Silvaria Marios and she's trying to figure out who it is that's been trying to kill her. Uh, give some sort of hint to the player characters that says who Silvaria Marios is. The way the module has it, she's just some random random, tough, nameless bad guy. Also, she's just sitting around in the ship this entire time while some sort of battle is raging outside. Uh, she's just like drinking some tea, waiting around in a closet, hoping the player characters come in so she can make some sort of a grand dramatic entrance for her big finale. So how I changed her was first, I traded one of her two gauze pistols for a gauze rifle. Other than that, I made no actual changes to her. She's tough enough as is. 
Next, I had her take an active role in the entire firefight. I had her climb up the elevator shaft because the power was cut. She couldn't take an elevator up, and taking it up might give him a hint that she was on her way. She got around behind the player characters, and she nearly killed Vince, Grista, and Coraline, and she did manage to blow up one of Vince's drones. She would strike really hard, and then she would retreat, melting into the shadows. She would come at them from every single direction. There would sometimes be long periods of time between her attacks, and the player characters are always looking over their shoulder because they didn't know when she was going to strike next. And she'd use her psionics to tell where the travelers were and if they knew where she was at any given time. Now, eventually, the travelers were all huddled underneath the scout ship on the first level, trying to figure out where she was in the shadows. Krista heard Silvaria drop down on the ship from one of the catwalks above. They figured out where she was, and while Savaria dropped down to finish off Ignis with her two static blades, Vince shot her with his sniper rifle. With Savaria's death, the scenario is over. That is the last scene that appears. The conclusion is all, hey, they got a sweet ship, what are they gonna do with it? Even though technically it should be Coraline's ship, right? I mean, she is the royal heir to this, it's the royal ship, she's already agreed to pay the travelers, and they've agreed to work for a certain price already, so it's not necessarily gonna have to be their ship. Then it goes on to address questions that the module never bothered to answer, like, hey, what's up with those clones? And what's up with these weird black orbs that are evidently technology from the ancients? That line is the first time in the module that it even mentions that these orbs are ancients tech, by the way. And then it promises to answer those questions in the sequel adventure Shadow of the Petrovskys, which is not out yet, by the way. And because this module doesn't answer any of these questions itself, I already did that for it. Overall, the mystery of BTSHT365 is a- Whoa, whoa, whoa! You haven't even brought up that scout ship that's still in orbit above us right now. Oh yeah. Well, once Savaria was dead and the travelers had taken prisoners of these workers and scientists and three clones, one of those was killed when a grenade blew up next to her cryoburst, so they only got three of them, they decided to deal with this orbiting ship. Now, I figured that they were either going to attack the ship with the Crucible, maybe uh, tag team it using the uh, Serpent-class scout ship as well, and try to hit it from two fronts. Or they were going to try to Trojan horse their way into it, maybe using the uh, modular cutter and having one of their prisoners fly it. Maybe they're behind the seat with a laser gun saying, you fly in there and you act like everything is cool. I figured those were the two most likely scenarios at which the travelers would try to take over this ship. However, I failed to take into account the most obvious solution. Yeah, we nuked it from orbit. It was the only way to be sure. Any time a player character has the option to use nuclear weapons, they're going to use nuclear weapons. This is a rule of role-playing games. So the travelers waited until the orbiting ship kind of lined up with the orbit of the station, and then using the crucible, they went ahead and activated the system defense, and the station launched a ton of nuclear torpedoes at the orbiting ship, blowing it completely to hell. That done, Coraline took charge of the Serpent-class scout ship for herself, and she worked out a deal with the Travelers where they were going to introduce her to Varut Nagal, the thief crime boss that hired him for the first job at the beginning of Act 1. I figured that was a good way to kind of wrap the scenario back in on itself. Her plan was she was going to try to work out some sort of arrangement of a trade to get one or both those black orbs back from him, which he could either take money for it, or maybe he could have some sort of use to do with kind of a secret planet that nobody knew about, because, you know, Ah, pirate lords. Maybe they want access to a secret planet. And with that done, the travelers jumped back to civilization. Overall, we had a lot of fun with this adventure. However, that also required that I did a lot of prep in order to make this playable. The module leaves a lot of unanswered questions that game masters are going to have to find answers to. And it makes a lot of assumptions as to what the player characters might do in certain situations, and doesn't offer any contingencies in case that's not what the players decide to do. It also tries to give them two extremely powerful and very expensive ships as rewards, and those could possibly throw out the balance of future games. The module needs more maps, it needs to explain certain details, such as uh, why all the stuff and Coraline ever ended up in this crappy little town and homestead in the first place. Game Masters are also going to need access to the Central Supply Catalog, the Vehicle Handbook, High Guard, Pirates of Drenax Harrier Class Book, just to get details on all the weapons and equipment that's inside of it, which I don't think it was necessary to use so much equipment from all of these accessory books. 
For example, the Harrier class book, you only need that to get the stats for breaching guns, which the player characters will discover in Act 4. I have a lot of Traveler scenarios that don't require that Game Masters have any accessory books in order to run them. Or if they do require an accessory book, it only requires that they have one. But this adventure requires that a Game Master seem to have access to all the accessory books out there. Now that all being said, for $2, it kept us highly entertained for 34 hours of playtime, which is some serious bang for the buck. And I wouldn't have chosen to have run this adventure in the first place if I didn't think that it looked like it would be a good fit for us, and it definitely was. But as is, I wouldn't recommend this scenario for other game masters out there. There's just too many unanswered questions and too many problems that I don't think this thing is ready to run as it is. However, if you've watched this series and you've thought to yourself, you know, hell yeah, that looks like I could do a lot of fun with that, and I've got all these great tips that you've given me now, so I could definitely run this and I know what to look out for. So for you, I stuck a link below to all the different maps that I made for this series. I don't need them anymore, so feel free to use them in your own game. I hope you have fun with it because we had a lot of fun with this adventure. Now one final suggestion. In the last video I mentioned that this missing planet is still very close to several systems, separated by only two parsecs. Now these aren't high tech level planets themselves, but high enough that they definitely see the star there, and a jump to ship with some extra fuel tanks might want to make that journey just to check out this planet, see if there's anything there. Now one commenter mentioned that maybe there should be a Dyson Sphere around the star or some sort of ancient tech that's masking it from all the other planets, and once the uh, station is destroyed or the uh, Doctor in the Act 3 is destroyed, uh, whatever's blocking that light from going out is therefore destroyed, and that light is then able to continue on to those other planets, which might take about seven years for it to get there, but eventually they're going to see the light from that star. Now I really dig the idea of a stealth planet, I think that is a really cool idea to do, but a much simpler method would just simply be moving it from here to a more remote location such as Rimward and four to five parsecs from the closest planet, making it much harder for anyone to get to. Just an idea. Yeah, we did have a lot of fun with this adventure, but I can't help but notice that you left out a couple details in your recounting of it for everybody, such as that time that Moto put away a perfectly good laser rifle and picked up a war pick and charged that dude in the cargo loader only to get his ass handed to him a couple seconds later. Or that time that we took that Augment Dune buggy and we armored it up into some sort of ghetto battle wagon that is still in our ship's hold. Or that time that Moto ate all that creme brulee, you know, the stuff it was laced with. Yeah, we don't need to talk about all that. Yeah, it's probably best that we do leave a few mysteries as to what our sessions are really like. Sorry. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews and how to's, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, travelers, you have a great day. You know, one day I want to do one of these campaign diaries where I ain't got to wear no stupid mask.